Support for tonight's programming on WQPT is provided in part by the Regional Development Authority, established in 1989. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. An American pandemic is no longer a theory, it's become our reality. And one man says he knew this day could come. We talked to him this week on The Cities. It's surreal to many of us that such a tiny little virus could have such a huge impact on our society. But COVID-19, a form of the coronavirus, has certainly shut down a big portion of our nation. For years, infectious disease specialist Dr. Lewis Katz of the Quad Cities has tried to prepare our area for this very real possibility. He sat down with me to talk about what's become our new reality. The president is saying that the next two weeks are going to be the most critical. Is that the way you see it? Is the next two weeks going to be tough for America? Yes, but I'm looking into July. I mean, I, two weeks, four weeks. I, we're in this for weeks and months, not days and weeks. And I think it's important that we not focus on the immediate future because I think um, the things that we're doing are going to extend well into the summer. And we need to be, we need to take a deep breath and be ready for this to go on for months. Do you think we're ready for that? I mean, when you, when you look at some of the uh, self-isolation that's been going on, it's only been going on for some people for just a week, some yes. for just two weeks, yeah. and people are already somewhat going stir crazy. Well, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. I'm talking to a lot of people every day and nobody's necessarily enjoying it, but most everybody I talk to is tolerating it, getting by, getting used to it. I think people will be very, very resilient, and there will be outliers that really are having a hard time, but there's no alternative. So uh, I have a daughter in Germany who's very itchy, and I keep telling her, you know, take a deep breath, relax. This is going to go on for a while and you need to be prepared for it to go on for a while. I can't say anything else. And, and I think talking in terms of next week or Easter or two weeks or the first of May is, uh, gives people a, a false optimism. Well, the president was also pretty much saying in, in a speech yesterday that it's almost going to be like a light switch. Once it's over, it's over. Um, I, I have the direct quote, in fact. He says, we're going to see things get better all of a sudden, and it's going to be like a burst of light. You're, you're seemingly saying that it's not going to be like a light switch. It's not going to be that one moment we have this problem, the next moment it's all clear. Boy, do I hope it is. Boy, do I think that's not correct. Uh, in, if you look in China, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Places that um, we're able to do things far more draconian than we have done and maybe can do, I'm not sure, in this country, um, the impact of their interventions took weeks to be clearly obvious. Um, and as they've started to back off a little bit in some of those places, China in particular, are starting to see second waves related to initially imported cases and subsequently community transmission. This is a long slog. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And people, and if it goes away, as the weather turns nice, I'll be happier than anybody to be wrong. But I don't 
think we should be counting on that. Well, and I was going to ask you that, in fact, is because a lot of people are equating this to the flu and the belief that once the seasons change, the problem changes. When you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. We don't know how this virus is going to respond to changes in the weather. It could get better. It could stay the same. It could get worse. We're dealing with the first wave of an infection that has only been recognized since the first of the year. And people need to avoid crystal balls beyond preparing the population for a long haul. Is the population also prepared for the damaging effect that COVID-19 might have? We're now talking 100,000 to 240,000 deaths are possible across the United States. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I lived through AIDS um, and hundreds of thousands of deaths. That was like a, a slow moving train wreck. This is just a car crash in real time. We handled it with HIV. I think we'll handle it with this. It doesn't make it pleasant. And um, no, I don't think there's an Im imminent breakdown in society. But, uh, um, but the best way to avoid that is for people to be realistic about the worst case. I was going to ask you because you were so involved in trying to limit the AIDS and still are the AIDS and HIV epidemic in the United States. How does this compare? Because as you said, it, it was a slow moving from the 80s into the 90s. Yeah. Also, a lot of people thought, hey, I'm not gay, I won't get it, as opposed to the coronavirus yeah, that, that uh, the doesn't pace know any is limits. The pace is entirely different and it's the age of the internet and social media. and. And so we, we've never dealt with something like this. And, and so I think, um, I think cautious optimism is OK. Predicting two weeks or four weeks, I think, is not a responsible approach to public messaging. And we need to be thinking about what if this is, we're in, the, in a similar position with social distancing in June and July and August. And um, I think that's the right way to look at it. What makes COVID-19, first of all, so deadly or so dangerous? And second of all, where did it come from? Why do we know so little about it? Well, I don't know what so deadly means. Um, the latest numbers, early in an epidemic, what gets recognized is only the worst cases. The sickest people are picked up first. And we're still there uh, in this epidemic. What we recognize as clinical cases, people who get sick, is a tip of the iceberg. And below that tip of, of the obviously ill people are people with minimal symptoms, unrecognized symptoms, no symptoms. And the latest modeling from credible sources suggests that, that the mortality rate, case fatality rate, is less than 1%. That's not trivial. That's like 1918. Estimates in 1918 flu were 1% or a little higher. And we're in that range. Well, 1% of 100 people is one death. 1% 1 of a million is 10,000 deaths. I mean, it's, it starts to look like a big number. Um, and so it has to be in context, in the context of numbers we don't really understand yet, like how many infections there really are, what percentage of people actually get sick, uh, whether there are ways to protect the most vulnerable from getting sick uh, that we haven't done yet. Those, you know, um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of things we don't know. The virus is a coronavirus. It's a very well-recognized group of viruses. There are seven that infect humans. Four of them cause common cold. Three of them cause serious illness. The first one was called SARS, serious, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003, 2004. That was seven, 8,000 cases and, and uh, some number of deaths, uh, about 10% mortality rate. The second one was in uh, the early 2010s called MERS or Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome. It's uh, still endemic in primarily in the Arabian Peninsula. 
has a mortality rate of one out of three versus the new virus, which we've known about since January, with a mortality rate that's going to be in the range of 1% and I think lower. Um, so you, you put that in context. The difference between the three is that there are many, many more infections with the new virus. So even with a low mortality, everybody is going to know somebody that had a bad outcome. That's what I think. Everybody is going to know somebody that has a bad outcome. And that stresses people. I get it. Are you surprised at how quickly it is spreading in the United States? I, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, when we saw what was going on in China, it raised an alarm fairly quickly. But as you know, I mean, China is easier to clamp down a society, as you were pointing out. Um, yes. Um, and then you take a look at free and open societies, let's say the Italy's of the world or the United States of the world, uh, even the India's of the world. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not surprised by the spread. I mean, the epidemiologic parameters, the numbers we use to understand spread, we're pretty accurate coming out of China. If you assume that their surveillance is accurate and transparent surveillance, which very trusted people from the WHO think it is, um, we knew enough about the virus before it took hold um, in the United States to understand that absent effective um, containment mitigation strategies, it could get pretty ugly. And it is. You've spent a life analyzing infectious diseases. You have known that there was the chance for a pandemic, perhaps not if, but when. Um, and I'm sure that you have tried your best to make sure society in our area is prepared for a day like today. Um, are you still surprised? the extent that this pandemic has, has changed society, or, 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 or do you think that we were as prepared as we could have been? No, we clearly weren't as prepared as we should have been. And it's very interesting. Um, in 2009, um, I chaired a working group at one of the national blood banking organizations, and our task was to advise blood collection facilities around the country and actually around the world on how to pull together a pandemic plan to deal with, with the 2009 influenza virus if it got really bad. So we all wrote plans. And uh, I... Almost that worst pan case scenarios? Oh, yeah, absolutely. How are you going to triage mm -hmm. scarce resources and the whole ball of wax? And, and that pandemic kind of fizzled. Right, It wasn't as bad as it could have been. And we put the pandemic plans up on the shelf or in a filing cabinet somewhere. And literally this last month, we have dusted them off. I mean, literally dusted them off uh, and adapted them to this. Uh, and this is what we were afraid of when that pandemic flu virus emerged in 2009, that it would be something like 1918 again. And we've got it. We're better prepared now than we were then, but we're not prepared enough. And uh, um, well, one wonders if this isn't the medical world's and society's 9/11. Um, is that after the terrorist attacks of September 11th, security got increased? We didn't take things for granted as we did uh, before that date. Is that kind of the way you see that this could be happening now? Is that people will now take the th the theory of a pandemic as a reality. Well, you're asking me to look into the future again, and, and I'm not going to do that. I have a strong sense that when this is over, uh, we'll have heightened awareness for some period of time, and then the awareness will be less than it should be. So I don't have great faith that, um, that we'll be ready for the next one, but I hope we're more ready for the next one than we were for this. Uh, at least we had plans from 2009. Businesses and, and all kinds of organizations uh, had plans that fit very well with the response we need to do here. The problem is the virus isn't completely cooperative, and we're, we're implementing things progressively uh, based on less data than we would like. And we'll get where we need to be, but we're not there yet, and we're not going to be there in two weeks. One of the other areas is that people think that if they don't have it, 
they're not going to get it and they're going to be fine. Let's take it past uh, the summer and beyond. But there are people that have weakened immune systems or people who have had surgery and are, are, are more susceptible, let's say. When this starts to the curve starts going down, those people are still going to be at a serious risk well beyond the summer. What, what do you say to those people? Um, they're going to need to do some of the social distancing things that we're talking about, maybe longer than the general population. Because the general population will start moving around, get within six feet, not realizing that somebody might have a weak yeah, immune system. I, I think that it may be, depending on how, the course of the epidemic and, and what we're understanding and, and whether we develop effective interventions on the fly, that certain groups of highly susceptible people will have to maintain social distancing longer than others. That starts to get hard when your neighbors do an X and you're told to do Y. Uh, but it's like everything else over the last couple of months. Ask me today, I'll give you an answer, and ask me tomorrow, it may have changed. And hopefully, we're trying to change our recommendations based on um, at least credible, if not definitive, evidence. How do you think it's going so far when it comes to the Quad City area, when it comes to the uh, rules of closing down the restaurants, closing down the gathering spots? I mean, that seems to have been almost, as you said, from a playbook from before. Um, yeah, it, it is. And I think we're blessed here that the, we haven't seen an inflection in the epidemic. Um, we have to count cases using surveillance, not testing, because of the shortage of tests and because of a lag time between when a test is set up and when the result comes back. We don't have great real-time testing data to tell us the shape of the epidemic curve. But we know who's getting sick. And so the shape of those two curves is likely the same. So we're looking for an inflection point to decide if we need to push on the powers that be to do more. For example, a shelter in place order uh, in Iowa, those sorts of things. We're looking for an inflection point, something that tells us it's getting significantly worse now than it was two days ago, three days ago. Um, and unfortunately, the testing data, the testing data from the state lab is spot on right away. It's great, but it's a fraction of the testing. And the private labs, we're being told, are, are 10 to 14 day delays with results. So we can't use the testing data. We have to use the clinical data. Um, who's sick? How many people are winding up in the hospital? Uh, that, that sort of thing. To have an idea. It's not ideal, but it should be good enough. Tell me about your colleagues. Are you a little worried about the, the medical men and women who are on the front lines right now, when, especially when you hear of the need for equipment and face masks? My son is an emergency room physician in San Antonio, Texas. I'm terrified for him. You know, He's going to work without adequate personal protective equipment. Um, some of us, when we became docs, signed up to do this stuff. And so at the end of the day, I'm still sleeping at night. But yeah, my son is front lines in a major metropolitan area as an ER physician, and, and I'm scared for him. What can we do about that? Follow the guidance of public health with regards to social distancing and hand washing and staying home when you're sick. All those things that we've been harping on since very early on, you need to do it, and you need to do it kind of compulsively. So you and I are sitting eight feet apart, nine feet apart. And I don't want you any closer than six feet. And I walk around the center uh, during the day, and when I see people less than six feet apart, I call them out. I'm, uh, we're using literally 10-gallon drums of hand sanitizer in the blood center to keep the donor room safe and our staff safe. And people need to pay attention to what public health has said. Uh, the media needs to vet everything that they're going to say with public health first to be sure it's accurate. So I understand that another media outlet uh, was reporting epidemic curves based on testing data yesterday, but they had no idea when the test had been done. So tests from 10 days ago were being counted in results that are now. And that's just, it gives a distorted picture. So everybody has to be very, very careful and we have to 
vet every bit of data that's being uh, disseminated very carefully to understand what's good about it and what's not. One last question is, this is going to be something we're going to live with for the rest of our lives. As you pointed out, HIV, AIDS, SARS, MERS, they didn't just go away. They're not eliminated. They're not gone. The same SARS is gone. Is it for the most part? SARS is extinct. It must be somewhere in a bat in China still. But no, there hasn't been a case since 2004. So might we see that with COVID-19 as well? Uh, we might. Uh, it, I, I think it's going to be more like MERS, but that's an impression that is not based on good data. Everybody who got SARS got sick. Most of everybody who got SARS got sick. People, there are a lot of people with COVID-19 infection who don't have, who have SARS coronavirus 2 infection who don't have COVID. That is, they're infect, they get infected with the virus and eventually clear it, but they never get sick. They never get the disease COVID-19. And so it's different than SARS. And, and I, I have a sense it's going to be endemic. It's going to, we're going to live with it for some period of time. That's fine. We'll develop a vaccine and maybe get rid of it when we have a vaccine. Again, too far in the future for me to understand. Not enough biomedical data available yet to understand. Uh, but, um, but I think it, it's with us for the immediate future. And next year and the year after, we'll worry about it as we get closer. Our thanks to Dr. Lewis Katz, infectious disease specialist, for joining us. Right now, as the nation is fighting the coronavirus, it is also trying to count its citizens. The 2020 census is underway right now. April 1st came and went, but were you ready to be counted? What is the 2020 census? Every 10 years, the census records everyone living in this country. It's written in the Constitution comes in a questionnaire that counts everyone who lives at your address on April 1st. The data can be used to inform funding for services like fire stations, schools, clinics, and representation that affect your community. Shape your future. Start here. Visit 2020census.gov. Why should I care about the 2020 census? Every 10 years, the census counts everyone living in the U.S. Count everyone living with you. Even kids! Our numbers help shape funding and services. For all these things. That's a lot of stuff. Your responses are safe and secure. No matter who you are or where you're from. We have reasons to care. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. Many of you are staying home, avoiding crowds, not going to concerts, and that means so many of these concerts have been canceled. Local musicians are really being kept off the stage. Well, we'll continue to feature some of those local musicians with their original music here on the cities. Musicians like Mo Carter, who joined us at the Black Box Theater in Moline to perform one of her originals called Crumbled. So easy 
That's Mo Carter with Crumbled. And we want to thank you for joining us for the cities. We also want to remind you that WQPT has some great programming online for your entire family, specifically your children. Go to our website at wqpt.org to learn more about the PBS Kids program. It includes several interactive apps and games that make learning fun. Plus, check out PBS for parents with online resources, including a section that helps moms and dads talk to their kids about the coronavirus. It's all free and family friendly. You can check it out right now at wqpt.org. Org. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.